My name is Andrew Zavala, and I'm going to tell you about my project working in STEM education out of East Africa. In 2021, I was a graduate of Harvey Mudd College, a fellow of the Napier Initiative, and a volunteer at Project Inspire. So just to share a little bit of background into how I ended up doing a project like this, I was personally impacted by several outreach programs similar to the one that I ended up volunteering for. And it's been a goal of mine to help support initiatives like this as they helped me realize my passion for engineering. So while I was trying to figure out how I could make something like that happen, um, the Office of Community Engagement introduced me to the Napier Initiative. And the Napier Initiative has a couple of programs, one of them being their fellowship program, which I became a part of during my senior year. And while I was a fellow, I was developing my project proposal as part of the program. And I found an organization called Project Inspire, and they work in STEM outreach to help strengthen the STEM education available in Tanzania. And uh, I began to develop a plan with them for me to be able to come and work with them on their different programs. And so uh, with the support of uh, people of Harvey Mudd and the Napier Initiative and my friends and family, I was able to make this project come to fruition. I spent four months in Tanzania in a couple of different regions uh, working with Project Inspire, and I mainly focused on STEM education resources, teaching practices, uh, gender representation and inclusion, and I also worked on some organizational planning uh, and some business practices. So it's really hard to encapsulate uh, such a grand experience, but I did want to share a few highlights. Uh, one of them being the opportunity that I had to collaborate with the African Mass Initiative, which is another outreach organization based in Kenya. And so I was able to go visit with them for some time and um, meet with their team and spearhead a collaboration between Project Inspire and African Maths Initiative for our STEM Youth Boot Camp of 2021. So this was a great experience because while working with one organization is uh, really good exposure, you learn about uh, sec the sector, you learn about um, all of these different aspects of, of doing outreach from uh, an administrative perspective, being able to have that exposure to a second organization provides so much more insight because you see the contrast and you really see the depth and the different facets and uh, the different styles. And so I really appreciated having that opportunity and making new friends and experiencing a new culture there in addition to my uh, experiences in Tanzania. I also had an opportunity to work on some grants, uh, which was really valuable because I uh, love to write. And so this is a really good way for me uh, and a possible opportunity for me to stay involved with organizations like this throughout the years uh, in some capacity. And then lastly, uh, but definitely not least was the cultural immersion aspect. And of course, uh, living in another country for an extended period of time comes with so many different um, uh, experiences. I know I keep using that word, but it's really hard not to <laughs> when I talk about this. Um, and so I really, really appreciated that aspect. That was something I was particularly seeking. So to be able to make it happen in today's day and age uh, was really powerful for me. So with that, I would like to thank the Office of Community Engagement and the Napier Initiative. Hello, my name is Tristan Huang. I was a engineering intern at City of Hope this summer. And the project that I worked on was a high performance pliable silicone nasal pharyngeal swab for improved patient comfort. So a little context about City of Hope. I think this quote by the founder of City of Hope, Samuel Golther, really summarizes what this research center and hospital is all about. There is no profit in curing the body if in the process we destroy the soul. This quote really um, emphasizes the fact that when it comes to helping others and doing work that is for other people, 
we have to be conscious of the impact of our work on other people and on society, have to understand the consequences that come with um, the actions that we do. And when you're conscious about the actions that you perform, you're better able to serve other people and do it happily. City of Hope is a nonprofit cancer research center and hospital located in Dorte, California. City of Hope has been a sponsor for the Harvey Mudd Clinic since 2013. And City of Hope has these six values, compassion, service with a sense of urgency, integrity, intellectual curiosity, excellence, and collaboration. And on the left, we have a picture of my team. Um, on the left um, is Colin Cook. He was my lead. And in the middle is Layla Weiberg. She is a senior at Harvey Mudd. Summer 2021 goals. Since this project was already, it had already been started um, by the fall 2020 clinic team and spring 2021 clinic team, we wanted to gain some insight off of the work they had already done and from there build off of it. So the work they had done was they designed several nasal swab prototypes, but unfortunately due to the remote nature of last school year, um, they the team was not able to actually create these swabs and test them. So we wanted to be able to create a, create a swab and test to see how well it, it behaved compared to other um, swabs that are more conventional. They also wrote a paper um, top at the top. I have a picture of the paper if anyone would like to check it out. We wanted to fabricate a high performance silicone swab. On the right, I have a computationally simulated rendering of the flexi swab, which we termed um, our nasal pharyngeal swab. We named it that because um, our swab is made of silicone is flexible, and then it's also a swab. We put it together, it comes out to be flexi swab. We, we wanted to conduct tests to prove superiority. Um, this included efficiency tests, um, efficiency tests such as dip tests. And on the right, we have a picture of the horizontal dip test that Layla actually performed this summer. And we also had tests for comfort, and these tests basically consisted of abrasion tests. And we also wanted to manufacture and possibly produce our swab. Working accom accomplishments. One of my first um, projects, um, I would say my second largest project was the hydrogel nasal passage to test for comfort. Because our swab was still under the works, we were not, and because um, it wasn't FDA approved, um, we weren't able to test on humans and get immediate feedback. So we went with the next best option, which was a model of the nasal passage that <clears throat> mimics how soft the material in the nasal passage actually is. And in order to do that, we created a hydrogel nasal passage. Hydrogel, in this case, we use agros, which is a type of jello. It's, it's because it's soft, it would be able to pick up all the abrasion marks and scratches. And we would be able to see that if there was less marks, that would imply that the swab is more comfortable and <laughs> less harmful to the nasal passage. So I began this project with a 3D principle nasal passage that I got online. From there, I simplified the model. I realized that we only needed to focus in on the part of the nasal passage that the swab would be inserted into and follow. So I got rid of all the other parts of the nasal passage, um, focused in on that one part. Um, and from there, I created a <clears throat> base for my mold and gel walls. And in the middle is a picture of the CAD 
um, model that I created for our hydrogel nasal passage mold. On the right um, is a picture of us manufacturing this mold. Um, we used a CNC 3D machine. <clears throat> and on the bottom left is a picture of the final product. And on the bottom right is the agros um, that came out of this Nasal, nasal passage model mold. My largest project this summer was to create the mold for a swab. So we decided to produce silicone swabs using injection molding. The injection molding process is you create a mold where the mold is the negative and the positive is the cavity that is empty and to be filled. And in this case, this part, which is our swab, that part is empty. And to create the swab, you would inject the material of interest. In this case, it is silicone into the mold and let that silicone set. And from there, take apart the mold and boom, you have your silicone swab. On the bottom left, um, there, these are pictures of the model that I created um, in CAD. And on the right is the actual mold that came in a week ago. An additional work this summer, I learned how to draw up a 2D mechanical drawing and perform FEM simulations. Um, this is a simulation of a force a pressure applied on the bristle. We want to see how, how bendable a bristle is and make sure that the bristle would not hurt the nasal passage and would be pliable enough to just bend down if it was applied a pressure. So the significance, um, COVID-19, nearly 3 billion COVID-19 tests have been administered worldwide and nearly 1 million tests are performed a day in the US. And our COVID swab has um, implications for future pandemics and even COVID-19, um, even though it's slowly dying down, it can really help um, make sure that the virus does not continue to spread because a lot of the spreading is done by asymptomatic individuals who do, do not know that they have the virus in this their system. And because of that, they end up going out and not realizing they're actually spreading the virus to a whole population of other people. <clears throat> and we also, we, we thought that a more comfortable swab would encourage people to test. And takeaways, I wrote up the, these two sentences these two paragraphs that I, I am gonna read. The mission of City of Hope, your strive for excellence and compassion has inspired me. They push the boundaries in a field that some individuals would term hopeless with the end goal of helping others. And that just shouts selflessness to me. The, the work that people at City of Hope do is very inspiring and they're, approach to problems are very, very positive and it's just a very nice environment that I have gotten a chance to work at. <clears throat> this was my first and it is a very important engineering experience that has shown me the design manufacture and knowledge that goes behind creating engineering devices I have garnered skills pertaining to the work I hope to do in the future, including CAD, CAM, injection molding, CNC machining, FEM. Future work. We have been invited by scientific reports to submit a manuscript. So we are currently finalizing the paper and we'll end up sending it, submitting it for review. And then soon I'll be published and after our swab is produced, we want to get it approved 
and end up testing it on humans to see how it actually performs in the real environment and scenario. And from there, we really hope to be able to manufacture our COVID swabs. And I would like to thank Colin Cook. He is a, he has been a really amazing mentor. He has taught me so many skills that will continue to help me as I pursue a career in engineering. Layla Weiberg, um, it's been awesome working with her. Um, she has done incredible work. Dr. Fong, thanks for making this this whole clinic team and bringing the summer 2021 team together. I want to thank the 2020 and 2021 clinic teams for laying the groundwork so that Layla, me, and Colin could build off of it. And I want to thank Danny Ledesma and Gabriela Gamez for providing the funds so that I can pursue this internship. And I wanna thank all the other people who um, have given so much for, for me to have this experience. And thanks for listening. Math major, and since this summer, I've been working with both Lucy Presence Labs and the Chicago-based Stop Shot Spotter Coalition. Um, Lucy Presence Labs is a group of transparency and digital rights activists um, who are challenging injustice in tech and policing. Um, the Stop Shot Spotter Coalition um, is aiming to cancel Chicago's $33 million contract with the Shot Spotter Company. The company sells hidden microphones that they claim can detect gunshots, but in reality, their system is dangerously inaccurate, placed almost exclusively in predominantly black neighborhoods, and automatically funnels police into these areas. A lot of this work has involved public records research, um, which has meant um, uh, requesting documents and contracts from government agencies through the Freedom of Information Act, or FOIA. I've sent dozens and dozens and dozens of requests, and it's been a, a frustrating to navigate process. This is one of the records I received where you can see this is supposed to be like a financial table and pretty much everything is redacted and this isn't too rare. But I was still able to find some very useful information for the Stop Shot Spotter Coalition. Um, showing like how Shot Spotter is being financed and used in Chicago. We learned that their $33 million contract was quietly granted an extension without the city council even knowing. Um, we saw that this contract didn't require ShotSpotter to be able to differentiate accurately between a firework and a gunshot, which is hugely problematic given how many alerts that they're sending out each day. Um, and we also found out the exact amount of money that the city spends on ShotSpotter each year. That's the number in the red box, the only unredacted line from this document. It's exceeding $8.54 million. So that is a huge amount of money, and I really invite you to think about how your community could be using like an amount of money like that that's been funneled like exclusively for surveillance. On um, the shot spotter company's marketing is really based on this idea of community safety, but their entire business model is profiting off of gun violence. Um, their unchecked false detections are sending armed police into neighborhoods thinking that everyone they encounter could have a gun, and that simply does not make communities safer and does nothing to address the root causes of gun violence. So this is definitely not an issue exclusive to Chicago. Um, this chart shows um, a list of cities from the ShotSpotter website that also have their technology. Um, and they had at least two new cities, Pasadena and Houston, this, um, so far this year. So um, what's next is I'm definitely going to continue working with the Coalition and Lucy Parsons Labs to pressure Chicago City Council to cancel their contract and to continue making information about the surveillance available to communities. 
I have also planned a Napier project to connect the anti-surveillance efforts in New York City and Chicago, which I hope to work on this summer, because um, this technology is being used all across the country. So I feel that our response to it also has to um, be united across multiple cities. So a lot of this work has involved public records and a lot of it has involved creating public records resources. So I wanted to share some of that with you and encourage you to try sending your own public records requests. Um, I have listed a few like kind of summarized steps, but this um, link should take you to a detailed template and kind of guide that I've created to help you through the public records process. I'm also very happy to help people one-on-one -on -one if they encounter issues. And uh, a big thanks to all of the people that I've worked on with this project who I've listed here. And um, please feel free to email me if you have questions, want more information, or are having trouble with FOIA requests. Thank you. Hi, my name is Puswan, and today I'll be talking about my project proposal for the Initiative Initiative. So what is the Napier Initiative? The Napier Initiative is a partnership between Pilgrim Place, which is a retirement home in Claremont, in between the five C's, in order to encourage leadership for social change. And this project comes from inspiration from two of the Pilgrim Place residents, particularly Davey and Joy Napier, who really wanted to work towards world peace and more just an inclusive society and towards environmental sustainability. Now, for the Napier Initiative, what you do is you propose a project and you go through this process of being paired with a mentor from Pilgrim Place, who they help you um, mentor you and help develop your ideas. And your project has to be related to fostering social justice or environmental sustainability or helping develop a more just and inclusive society of some sort. Now, the proposal for my project was a collaboration between Upward Bound, which is a program at Harvey Mudd that helps tutor uh, low income and potentially first generation students in the San Gabriel Valley and having them learn about mathematical modeling in order to gain insight about the housing crisis in their community. In particular, I proposed a program for over the summer to students to learn more about mathematical modeling, understanding um, and getting data about the housing nearby and analyzing this data and seeing and brainstorming, brainstorming with the students and about particular uh, solutions so that they would not only see that math isn't frigid and formulaic, but rather a branch of inquiry, but also see how much power they really have in enacting social justice in the context of the housing crisis as well. That's basically my project, and I'm waiting funding for that. And I forget to mention that if you do get selected for funding, I believe it's around $20,000. And that's it. Uh, I would like to thank these people, particularly uh, Gabri Gabriela Gamitz. She was the one who actually let me know what the Napier Initiative was. So without her, I wouldn't be uh, going through this process or propose my project at all. Uh, I would also like to thank my mentor, Bill Dodge. He helped us um, help listen to my ideas and develop my project more. And also I would like to thank my other Napier fellows as well and the Napier Initiative as well. Thank you.